So I'm Dr Edson Burton and I'm a writer historian and I've been working with the Watershed um, for the last like 15 years I think. I, I first started working in the Watershed uh, when I was working at the African Caribbean Library of San Corre and uh, we used to have a Black Pyramid Film Festival based here. And I've been asked, um, wh why the Watershed? Why do I um, encourage my friends and those who I know within Bristol's diverse community to come here. And for me, it's about building partnership and it's about building relationship with film, with diverse films, with films from uh, uncomfortable perspectives, especially for a city like Bristol, thinking, of course, of 12 Years a Slave, for example, um, which often we get to see, but we don't get a chance to, to talk about and to untangle some of the things that it brings up. So I'm part of The Hub, uh, which is a program to develop programming experience and one of a few new programmers, and we've called ourselves Come the Revolution. With that being because, as you'll see in this drama and thinking about today, that often when there are revolutionary moments, there are groups that are left out, excluded, um, not quite respectable enough at this time. So the revolution always postponed. And we want to, over the next year or so, do something to suggest how we can have an inclusive transformation. But Martin Luther King and Selma. Well, um, when I was in my first year at university, um, my landlady uh, thought that I looked like Martin Luther King. And for that reason, she sort of prevented me from having a social life, believing that university would, would taint me and corrupt me and obviously uh, destroy my path to the White House. And uh, she certainly ruined my love life for a whole year, that's for sure. But in some ways, Martin Luther King was quite close to, to my experience growing up um, as, a, as a sort of an ideal archetype. Um, because when I think of, for example, the other alternatives that were there, I grew up during the era, I guess, of, of riots across Britain's inner cities in the 80s and so on. And also very much alive to the other forms of protest, the Martin Luther King, uh, Rastafarianism uh, and so on. So Zionism militancy and those other sort of options for protest against um, oppression and so on. And so when I came to, 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 to find out about the film and to, to realise it was coming, I came to it with an, open, with an open mind. I mean, I was brought up to think of Martin Luther King as almost a saintly figure. And earlier today in an interview with Ujima, I described the film as taking him from the mountaintop and putting him in the street among the foot soldiers, other leaders and ordinary people. And so, and in fact, that is a true reflection of what I think the film did, because Martin Luther King during his life was actually regarded as a militant um, by many who thought that it was better to leave things unsaid. If we don't talk about race, if we just believe that separate is un, and separate um, can be equal, if we just don't disturb the status quo, it will all go away. And aren't you the one who's um, stirring up the trouble? Aren't you the one creating the hornet's nest? He was also not regard, regarded as not militant enough. Martin Luther, sorry, Malcolm X, who makes an appearance in the film, um, along with other sort of strains of black nationalism, believed that black and white Americans will never agree. And there was a strain of black militant, black nationalist thought which swept right through the diaspora. That's what we call the, the global black community. So you see that movement in Southern Africa. You also see that movement in Britain as well. And so therefore, how can you plead or make alliance with or try and um, appeal to the better nature to people who you regard almost as devils. And that was the opinion of black nationalism. And that there was no point in integrating. What are we integrating into? And so Martin Luther King was regarded as not militant enough. He was also not white enough morally. And there's been revelations about Martin Luther King's character and there also, it was a powerful tool in the FBI's armor. We see that in the way it ruined other African-American leaders and so on. That unless you were morally whiter than white, then the whole movement could be thrown aside. Because again, the, it would play up ideas of black criminality, hypersexuality, and so on. So we're not talking about a level playing field here. We're talking about a situation in which uh, Martin Luther King um, in a sense, had to appear to be almost saintly. And so this was the mythologies that I grew up with. Um, and in a sense, in the review which I've written, which you may be able to see it on, on the way downstairs, um, 
it was about tackling these mythologies and I think dismantling those. Because for me, and I think the curriculum to some extent, when I speak to young people, still does this. Um, creates a sort of an infantile notion of heroes, where they are without blemish, where they are filled of sort of Rambo-like, reckless courage. And of course, what I think this thing will do, and I won't say, uh, I won't be a spoiler, is to make him into the pragmatist and organizer and leader of a broader movement. And it's important to say a broader movement because again, one of the, the issues has been that the civil rights movement has been focused on Martin Luther King solely and hasn't looked at, of course, his place within a broader movement of people like Rosa Parks, the woman who, who is actually a member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, who led a bus boycott in Montgomery. Um, also, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is a group of young radical Christians who participated and did a lot of grassroots organizing, and also groups like CORE. So you will see a whole stream a foundation of black protest and organization. And the church was essential to that. And this is not sort of a, a, a kind of a, a plea for churches, but you can see there was an organize, organizational base behind him which made the civil rights action possible, but also the collective talents of men and women who very bravely um, and pragmatically, because they understood that they didn't have weapons and tools to fight against um, the forces in the federal governments in the South. But it also, in terms of contextualization, why I say a pragmatist, is that as in our modern age that we understand that the battle for hearts and minds is not so much fought with weapons, that perhaps comes later or even alongside, but it's thought through opinion. And how do we shine a light on opinion? We use the media. And Martin Luther King was way ahead of his time in realizing that throughout his campaigning life, that the attention of the media was absolutely important. And why was it important? Well, because we now live in a, a post-Cold -Cold War world. Perhaps we're heading for one again, but at least we've had a hiatus. But at the time of the Cold War, the appeal of the West to developing countries in Asia and in Africa, the appeal of the West was on the notion of democracy and equality, especially as nations began to decolonize. But the reality was that in Britain you had a color bar, in the US, you had segregation, which is legally enforceable. And so therefore, if you could shine a light on these discrepancies, this Achilles heel in democracy, then in a sense, you, you had to close that Achilles heel, you had to heal that wound, because it played into fears that actually these unincorporated minorities, what the American historian Gunnar Murdahl called the American dilemma, this dilemma would fester and would feed into the, the turnover into communism among groups across the world. And in fact, this is a very true, um, it is very much the case that in fact, many black nationalists were born in Britain. Nkrumah, Senghor, who became leaders of African nations. They came here as missionary students, believing very much in the equality of empire, and then found that they couldn't find room or lodgings and they were discriminated against. And that led to nationalist movements. And many of those have played with socialism. So Martin Luther King understood very powerfully, and the rest of the movement did, that it was all about what the world saw. It was about making people aware of what was happening in the US and how this would play with the anxieties of that time. I also think this is film for me was important because it shows a Martin Luther King who's 10 years into the civil rights movement. This is 10 years since the first uh, marches and so on, since 1954. And so it's Martin Luther King who's tired, who is doubtful. But it's not new. And one of the things which I was surprised to find when rereading his letters is his very early uh, sense of his um, worthiness or questions of his worthiness to, to lead this movement, his position within it. Also, whether or not it was a cult of his own ego or whether it was something greater and more profound. So it captures that too. Why I think this film is important. And I think it's important because of, of course, its relevance to today where this issue of hearts and minds and so on has now gone into a different place, perhaps about the radicalization of young people to, to radical Islam or other forms and so on. And it's about political engagement and what happens when we don't feel, when people feel alienated and don't engage. In the States, it, it's been riots in Ferguson and so on, and there have been marches in solidarity with that 
disregard for black life in, in London and so on. So it raises questions too. But it also, I think, at the end, you, you perhaps think that it's, this is a film about renewal too. It's a renewal in the sense of what is activism? Can we all be activists? It's not great people, it's not people on mountaintops, it's ordinary people. And that's what you get to see, the, the way in which it crescendos and collapses the great and the mighty and the smaller and so on. And finally, a, a simple plug for um, what will be happening later on. The Watershed will be having some voxes, vox pops I should say, and the vox pops will be in the room um, on my on the right when you come out through the door. So it's just up from the, the lavatory. And um, it will say um, filming in progress. So just to grab your opinions, what you thought of the film. Um, the Vox Boxes will be very short, so if anyone wants to take part and leave their, their, leave their thoughts behind, uh, you won't have to wait for very long. But just to entice you, there will be vouchers for drinks for those who want to do the Vox Box. And I know that is not going to be the reason why you'll stay behind. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Um, the film does its it talks for itself. So uh, I hope you enjoy it and see you again. <laughs>